Hesav Shalom, my friends. Grace and peace to you. My name is Ron, and oh, it's good to be with you again. It certainly is. Most certainly is. Well, we're reading through Torah. We're reading the portions. And yes, portions were just a little bit before chapter and verse, and they're both good, okay? But this week we are reading the portion called Emor. Emor means to speak. And so we will speak of this couple of chapters here uh, this week. Those chapters are Leviticus chapter 21 and 22, and 23 and 24. We will speak more of chapter 23 and 24 later this week. Today we want to look into these first two chapters. And so before we do, let's uh, go to our Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you. We adore you and we look into your word. We engross ourselves in the words of Torah and ask that your Holy Spirit would just guide us, enlighten our hearts to your Torah, as the, uh, the ancient prayer said. And, and we just uh, are so thankful that you do so. And as we look into these uh, very stringent pieces of information, may even this seep into our hearts and remind us of, well, the way we once were. <laughs> and it's a good thing to be reminded, Father, as we look forward to growing in you. B'Shem Yeshua, in Jesus' name, Amen. Well, as we look into Amor, I just will uh, begin this way. In Moriel HaKanim, Bene Aharon means literally speak to or literally speak into the high priesthood, the sons or descendants of Aharon. In our first look into Parashat Amor, we will speak of 40 prohibitions spoken to the Kohanim. 40 prohibitions spoken to the high priesthood of Yisrael. 33 of these prohibitions appear in chapter 21 of Leviticus, and 7 of them appear in chapter 22, verses 1 through 16 of the same book. Inasmuch as these prohibitions, at least most of them, are not given to all of Israel, the Kohanim, the high priesthood, still yet dwell within the middle of the people and so have practical influence upon the people in general. So all I'm seeking to say within this conversation is this. If you're not a descendant of Aharon, brother of Moshe, then you need not have need for observance in all of that which is in these two chapters. But then again, in short, the most stringent observance is from the high priest himself. Next in line of stringent observance are the Levites, and then finally the what we would call the laity. Moshe would be tops in this way of life, while Yeshua is over Moshe and the whole house of Israel, according to Hebrews chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, which quotes Numbers chapter 12, verse 7. So enough, uh, you know, kind of rambling into this introduction of these chapters. Let me go ahead and read those first six verses for you. Of course, reading in any translation will lose a little bit of something, but nonetheless, that's how it goes. You understand that. We are thankful for translations. This is Dr. David Stern's translation. It says, chapter 21 of Leviticus, Adonai said to Moshe, Speak to the Kohanim, the sons of Aharon, and tell them, No Kohen is to make himself unclean for any of his people who dies, except for his close relatives, that is, his mother, father, son, daughter, or brother. He may also make himself unclean for his virgin sister, who has never married and is therefore dependent on him. He may not make himself unclean because he is a leader among his people. Doing so would profane him. Kohanim are not to make bald spots on their heads, mar the edges of their beards, or cut gashes in their flesh. Rather, they are to be holy for their God and profane, not profane, the name of their God. For they are the ones who present Adonai with offerings made by fire, the bread of their God. Therefore, they must be holy. Uh, just a, a real short um, statement here. 
In this context, to make oneself unclean is suggestive of taking a break from one's otherwise continued focus upon the Lord and the duties thereof. Such a lapse in focus becomes necessary for the high priest when Shadarim, or that is, close relatives, die. Again, pulling your hair from your head is a sign of deep mourning and or anguish. You know, <laughs> today we might feel like we want to pull hair out of our head merely when we're heavily f uh, frustrated, but uh, nonetheless, the ancient act of pulling hair from your head and, and the like, or cutting yourself, was an act of the dead mourning the dead. Okay, the walking dead mourning the physically dead. Let's look at Leviticus 21, verses 7 through 9. Just I just make comments on these briefly because I'm, a, I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to speak to you as an individual. Leviticus 21, 7 through 9 says, A Kohen is not to marry a woman who is a prostitute, who has been profaned, or who has been divorced, because he is holy for his God. Rather, you are to set him apart as holy, because he offers the bread of your God. He is to be holy for you, because I, Adonai, who makes you holy, am holy. The daughter of a Kohen who profanes herself by prostitution profanes her father. She is to be put to death by fire. Okay, the top leadership is not to marry a prostitute. In fact, I think it would be a good idea for all of us to stay away from that idea. If he marries someone who has been divorced, he potentially sets himself up for witnessing a pattern that didn't go away with the tying of a knot. The high priest who mediates between God and man is to avoid compromising such a ministry in its attention to him. So, again, this is stringence that is applied to someone whose devotion, whose... Uh, uh, point of view, point of uh, the vision of his eye is always on the Lord himself. Leviticus 21 verses 10 through 12. It says, The Kohen who is ranked highest among his brothers, the one on whose head the anointing oil is poured and who is consecrated to put on the garments, is not to stop grooming his hair, tear his clothes, go, to, go into where any dead body is or make himself unclean, even when his father or mother dies. He may not leave the sanctuary then or profane the sanctuary of his God because the consecration of the anointing oil is on his head. Uh, the, the anointing oil of his God is on him. I am Adonai. Okay, this part here highlights the anointing oil, the, uh, the oil of anointing. And before I read my little gist here, I'm reminded at this point, now I don't, I don't give the uh, sod of the Torah here, that is the secret, the mystery of the Torah, in these particular podcasts. In fact, I hardly, I don't even get into the drosh very often. I'm, I might mention a hint of scripture now and then, but let me give you a little bit of sod here, a little bit of uh, secret or mystery. In the phrase, here's the phrase I will quote it, the Kohen who is ranked highest among his brothers, the one on whose head the anointing oil is poured. In that phrase, every third letter spells out Dam Yeshua, meaning blood of Yeshua or blood of Jesus. Again, I'll read those words again. The Kohen who is ranked highest among his brothers, the one on whose head the anointing oil is poured. Those words, every third letter of those words, spells the phrase, blood of Jesus, blood of Yeshua. In other words, the section that highlights the anointing oil, or the oil of anointing, the oil of Mashiach, the, uh, the oil of Messiah. Okay, This is speaking of the oil of Messiah being the blood of Messiah. Okay, so... Actually, these, these things are important, is what I'm basically trying to say, okay? Even right down to the, uh, the Sot of the Torah. Now, I'm, I'm giving, this is one time I'm giving that to you. I, I don't usually do this, but it just popped into my head to say it. Let me read my normal note. Torah continues to remind the Konim, 
the high priesthood of the high importance of their office being issuing a prohibition before issuing a prohibition death was not quite so separated then as now the high priesthood had to maintain his the high priest had to maintain his physical position within the Mikdash, within the tabernacle even when mom or dad had passed on he could mourn them yes but he was not to enter the place of their bodies a high standard indeed Again, Ron's reading of this tells me that the high priest on duty could, uh, could quote, make himself unclean in the sense of knowing the sadness of a close relative's passing, but he could not leave and go to where the body was or tear himself, tear into himself as such a mediator. He was, he was not to diminish himself even though his mom or dad died. He was not to diminish himself for the position he held at the time. Again, the anointing oil, the oil of Messiah, the oil of Messiah is the blood of Messiah on him. And so he takes that importantly. He takes it as a high position. Leviticus 21, verses 13 through 15 says, He, the high priest, is to marry a virgin. He may not marry a widow, divorcee, profaned woman, or prostitute, but he must marry a virgin from among his own people and... Uh, not disqualify his descendants among his people, because I am Adonai, who makes him holy. Okay. In short, Mr. High Priest and his descendants must marry only virgins. Uh, you know, among females, of course. I have to say that nowadays. Today, such a thing may seem unheard of, but such is always a possibility. If you If you hang around me where I live and so forth, you will note that recently I've been... Uh, repeating the repeated phrase within the New Testament, with God, all things are possible. And that includes Mary and virgins. Well, okay. Got that out of the way. You understand. Leviticus 21, verses 16 through 24. To finish up this chapter. Adonai said to Moshe, Tell her own, none of your descendants who has a defect may approach to offer the bread of his God. No one with a defect may approach, no one blind, lame, with a mutilated face or a limb too long, a broken foot or a broken arm, a hunched back, stunted growth, a cataract in his eye, festering or running sores or damaged testicles. No one descended from Aharon the Kohen who has such a defect may approach the presence to present the offerings for Adonai made by fire. He has a defect and is not to approach the bread, to offer the bread of his God. He may eat the bread of his God, both the especially holy and the holy, only he is not to go into the curtain or approach the altar, because he has a defect, so that he will not profane my holy places, because I am Adonai, who makes them holy. Moshe said these things to Aharon, his sons, and all the people of Israel. So, a high priest was not permitted to enter the holy place, the Kadosh, the place of holiness, to minister at the golden altar if he was not whole. And the Hebrew word here is shalem. This spoke specifically of his body with an import already made concerning his spiritual and mental faculties. What I'm trying to say here is the Hebrew word shalem, which is used here, speaks of inner health inner wholeness but clearly here it's speaking of his body with the import already understood in the word shalom being that he has to be whole and healthy within himself first he was still free to eat of the offerings be they holy of holies or that is especially holy or merely holy and we'll read a, a little bit more of that as we go leviticus 22 verses 1 through 16 it says, Adonai said to Moshe, Tell Aharon and his sons to separate themselves from the holy things, separate themselves from the holy things of the people of Israel, which they set apart as holy for me, so that they will not profane my holy name. I am Adonai. Tell them, Any descendant of yours throughout all your generations who approaches the holy things that, I, that the people of Israel consecrate to God, to Adonai, is and is unclean, will be cut off from before me. I am Adonai. 
Any descendant of Aharon with Zara'at, or discharge, is not to eat the holy things until he is clean. Anyone who has touched a person uh, made unclean by a dead body, or who had had a seminal emission, or who has touched a reptile or insect that can make him unclean, or a man who is unclean for any reason and who can transmit to him his uncleanness. The person who touches any of these will be unclean until evening and is not to eat the holy things unless he bathes his body in water. After sunset he will be clean and afterwards he uh, may eat the holy things because they are his food. But he is not to eat anything that dies naturally or is torn to death by wild animals and thereby make himself unclean. I am Adonai. The Kohen must observe this charge of mine, otherwise, if they profane it, they will bear the consequences of their sin for doing so and die in it. I am Adonai, who makes them holy. No one who is not a coin may eat anything holy, nor may a tenant or employee of a coin eat anything holy. But if a coin acquires a slave, either through uh, purchase or through, his, through being born in his household, he may share his food. If the daughter of a Kohen is married to a man who is not a Kohen, she is not to have she is not to have a share of the food set aside from the holy things. But if the daughter of a Kohen is a widow or divorcee and has no child, and she is sent back to her father's house as when she was young, she may share in her father's food, but no one not a Kohen is to share in it. If a person eats holy food by mistake, he must add one-fifth to it and give the holy food to the Kohen. They are not to profane the holy things of the people of Israel that they have set apart for Adonai, and thus cause them to bear guilt requiring a guilt offering by eating their holy things, because I am Adonai, who makes them holy. Okay. Uh, a bit of a statement on this. The, the high priesthood was, or is, to have great respect for the holy things, the offerings of the people of Israel. Even when offering them, the high priesthood had need of remembering the height of which of what was being offered or what was occurring there. In other words, the, the people were bringing him food and he was to respect that and, and consider it a high thing being done. Knowingly officiating for a person's offering in a state of Tameh, a state of inner lack of health could affect being cut off, could affect being a, a karet, a, a temporary cutting off. From having a condition of tzara at to that of a seminal emission issue could affect the service of this all-important mediator, becoming unclean by eating something of the like or touching it could also have its negative effects on the service of the high priest. Uh, understand that if you eat something that's lying in the field, having been torn by an animal, you don't know how, it's, how long it's been laying there. Yes, it could have effects on you. The only individuals who could share in the Cohen's personal food were those who were directly dependent upon him and his house. Just as the Cohen, the high priest, is to have respect toward the holy things of the people, so also the people were not to mooch or sponge from the Cohen's food. Okay, let's look at, uh, and that's, that's pretty simple. If someone is living with you, then they're dependent on you. If they're not living with you, they should make their own way. Leviticus 22, verses 17 through 25 says, Adonai said to Moshe, Speak to the people, or pardon me, <laughs> speak to Aharon and his sons, and to the entire people of Israel, and tell them, when anyone, whether a member of the house of Israel or a foreigner living in Israel, brings his offering, either in connection with a vow or as a voluntary offering, and brings it to Adonai as a burnt offering, in order for you to be accepted, you must bring a male without defect from the cattle, the sheep, or the goats. You are not to bring anything with a defect because it will not be accepted from you. Whoever brings a sacrifice of peace offerings to Adonai in fulfillment of a vow or as a voluntary offering, whether it come from the herd or from the flock, it must be unblemished and without defect in order to be accepted. 
If it is blind, injured, mutilated, has an abnormal growth, or has festering or running sores, you are not to offer it to Adonai or make such an offering by fire on the altar to Adonai. If a bull or lamb has a limb which is too short or too long, you may offer it uh, as a voluntary offering, but for a vow, it will not be accepted. An animal with bruised, crushed, torn, or cut genitals, you are not to offer to Adonai. You are not to do these things in your land, and you are not to uh, receive any of these from a foreigner for you to offer as bread for your God, because their deformity is a defect in them. They will not be accepted from you. Okay. Uh, offerings in Zavak Shlamim. Zavak Shlamim are peace offerings, pe offerings of wholeness. They're off they are Zavak means something that you eat, and so these these are free will offerings, simply because you now have wholeness within you. You now have shalom within you, and you offer that, and you take part in that. They can be presented, again in short order with the word foreigner, added into the invitation and prescription here. It becomes important again to note that there are, in this passage, two different words, in the text for a foreigner. There are four different words translated foreigner or stranger in King James and those four words have four different meanings and I like to say that because nowadays we are wrestling over how we treat the foreigner. Well there are different words for that. The first occurrence in, is in verse 18 when it talks about the ger who mean the ger means convert. It's not just a foreigner the way we think of foreigner. It actually means a convert. This so-called foreigner, this convert, not only lives with Israel, but also offers offerings of and zivakim within the tabernacle. Zivakim means that he's offering peace offerings. He has peace with you. He has wholeness with you. He has health with you. Therefore, with you, he is eating with you because he is part and parcel with you. Therefore, he is not, by definition, a foreigner. He is a gear, a convert, into what you are doing. The second case is that of verse 25 with the word nekar. This particular foreigner, nekar means basically something or someone questionable. This foreigner may or may not be alongside you as a well-trusted friend. His or her faithfulness to the community is a little too questionable. And yes, don't bring the Lord your trash. This particular foreigner, this questionable one, may be bringing something for you to offer. He's bringing an offering for you to give to God that is simply wrong. It, it is simply not fitting for your God to receive. He's from another God you see and he will confuse that and you need not accept that confusion while you are confused you are not shalom you are you don't have wholeness within you you are separated you are confused within yourself you need not accept that okay don't accept something when you are in a state of confusion such as we are in america right now okay so the text goes on to say, don't bring the Lord your trash. He's the king of the multiverse. You wouldn't bring a king your trash. Don't bring him your trash. By the way, the inclusion of the offerings from a gear, from a convert, okay, you can have offerings from a convert, of course, because he's part of you. He's one with you. And that inclusion serves as a segue into chapter 23, which we will speak of, well, tomorrow. Just hang on a little bit there. Okay. Leviticus 22. Let me take a, a drink from this cup of truth real quick. Uh, oh, good stuff. And please pardon the slurping. I'm sorry. Um, Leviticus 22, verses 26 through 28. Read something like this. Adonai said to Moshe, When a bull, sheep, or goat is born... It is to stay with its mother for seven days, but from the eighth day on, it may be accepted uh, for an offering made by fire to Adonai. However, no animal is to be slaughtered together with its young on the same day, neither cow nor ewe. 
And a very simple comment on that would be this. Offerings of animals were done no earlier than one year of their age. However, it is permitted to offer the animal no earlier than eight days old. But again, and I know I'm, I address feelings as well. The offerings of animals always took place between one and three years from the animal's birth. Okay, I, I know that the, the Bible says that you may offer it as young as eight days old. That is, you may do this, but that doesn't mean you shall do this. Okay, the offerings were always done once the animal was no less than one year old. By the way, how young were those chickens? turkeys or bovine when they were butchered and cooked for your personal enjoyment. Hmm? Just, you know, if you're sensitive about what you read in the Bible, then you might apply that same sensitivity to what you eat at a restaurant. You know, so I, you know, no need to be a hypocrite. Leviticus 22, verses 29 and 30, to finish this up. Well, okay, there's 31 there, and through 33, but I'll speak of that in a bit. Let's begin finishing this up, I should say. Leviticus 29-30 says, When you offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving to Adonai, you must do it in a way such that will be accepted. It must be eaten on the same day it is offered. Leave none of it till morning. I am Adonai. You know, I'm not much for implications. You know, implications in our own, are in our own head, but... I will go ahead and allow you, or, you know, say that I have implied something here, that the way this is accepted is that you enjoy it and eat it all up, but, you know, that's that's merely an implication. My note that I wrote for this says, again, eat the Zavak Todah. The Zavak Todah, Zavak means something that you eat. Todah means thanksgiving. If I say Todah to you, I'm saying thank you. You eat that on the same day in which you are thankful. Eat it all up when you are thankful. Eat that thankfulness. Enjoy it. Okay. Leviticus 22, in the last verses there, 31 through 33, says, You are to keep my mitzvot and obey them. You are to keep my commandments and obey them. I am Adonai. You are not to profane my holy name. <coughs> <coughs> Pardon me. You are not to profane my holy name. On the contrary, I am to be regarded as holy among the people of Israel. I am Adonai, who makes you holy, who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am Adonai. It is Adonai. It is the Lord who makes us holy. Therefore, we are to be holy. That is, we must appropriate what is given to us. We must appropriate what has been set inside of us. Otherwise, it just sets there. Making assumptions upon a text and an eternal sacrifice without it, you know, without living it out, without being that person whom the Lord is making in you, it's insulting to his person and to his holiness. Again, if you have been washed clean without putting his holiness into you, bigger and badder monsters will invade the empty space. So do who you are be the biblical person that we are that you know that you can see in the bible that you are meant to be okay let's uh let's look at the haftarah the haftarah the word haftarah means after the torah haftarah is the reading of the prophets a section of the prophets after the reading of the torah portion so the portion of the prophets should align with the portion you just read in Torah. This week's uh, Haftarah is Yechezkel, Ezekiel, chapter 44, verses 15 through 31. Let me go ahead and find that and read it for you. Uh, okay, here it is. Ezekiel, chapter 44, verses 15 through 31. I'll read it uh, fairly quickly. It's about half that chapter. However, the Kohanim the high priesthood, who are Leviim, who are Levites, and the descendants of Tzadok, who took care of my sanctuary when the people of Israel went astray from me. They are the ones who will approach me and serve me. It is they who will attend me and offer me the fat and the blood, says Adonai. Adonai the word here is Adonai Yodevave, Lord, Lord. 
They will enter my sanctuary, approach my table to minister to me and perform my service. Once they enter the gates in the inner courtyard, they are to wear linen clothing. They are not to wear any wool while serving at the gates of the inner courtyard or inside it. They are to wear linen turbans on the heads and linen underclothes on their bodies. They are not to wear anything that makes them sweat. Before going out to the people in the outer courtyard, they are to remove the clothes in which they minister, lay them in the holy rooms, and put on other clothes, so that they won't transmit holiness to the people by means of their clothing. They are not to shave their heads or let their hair grow long, because, but must keep their hair carefully trimmed. No Cohen is to drink wine when he enters the inner courtyard. They may not marry a widow or divorcee, but must marry virgins descended from the house of Israel or a widow whose deceased husband was a Kohen. They are to teach my people the difference between holy and common and enable them to distinguish between clean and unclean. They are to be judges in controversies and they are to render decisions in keeping with my rulings. At all my designated festivals, they are to keep my laws and regulations, and they are to keep my Shabbats holy. They are not to come to any dead person, because this would make them unclean. However, for father, mother, son, daughter, brother, or sister who has had no husband, that they make themselves, they may make themselves unclean. After Cohen has been purified, he is to wait seven days. Then on the day he enters the sanctuary, when he goes into the inner courtyard to minister in the sanctuary, he is to offer his sin offering, says Adonai, Adonai, <laughs> Lord, Lord. Their inheritance is to be this. I am their inheritance. You are not to grant them any possession in Israel. I am their inheritance. I am their possession. They are to eat the grain offerings, sin offerings, and guilt offerings, and everything in Israel devoted to God will be theirs. The first of all the first fruits of everything and every voluntary contribution of everything from all your offerings will be for the Kohanim. You are also to give the Kohanim, you are also to give the high priest the first of your dough so that a blessing will rest on your house. It's called challah bread. The high priesthood are not to eat anything, bird or animal, that dies naturally or is torn to death. Okay, so to begin this conversation, I don't think I have to remind you of this particular matter. But one of the matters agreed upon by both Jews and not so Jewish is that Ezekiel 43, I just read to you part of Ezekiel 44, but Ezekiel 43 is the same scene of Messiah coming back to Jerusalem through the Eastern Gate. It opens up that way. It says this, After this he brought me to the gate facing east. There I saw the glory of God of Israel, Israel approaching from the east. Now, Jew and Gentile both agree that the glory of God is the Messiah. His voice was like the sound of rushing water, and the earth shone with its glory. Now you'll hear the Messiah described that way in the book called The Revelation. The vision seemed like a vision I had seen when I came to destroy the city. Also, the visions were like the vision I seen by the, by the Kivar River, and I fell on my face. Adonai's glory entered the house through the gate facing east. Okay, so it's agreed across the board that that is where the great Shabbat, the millennial kingdom, the millennial era, begins with Ezekiel chapter 43, what I just read. Here I have read to you the portion of Ezekiel 44 that takes place within the Great Shabbat. It takes place within the millennial era. Now there is, yes, a spiritual side of this that we can take part in now, but physically speaking, it prophesies a time that is yet to come. So, let's talk about this a little bit. We see within this Haftarah, that the same strict requirements for the high priesthood with Leviticus appears again in the Messianic era. It appears again in the Millennial Kingdom. The only thing added 
which some see as implied in Leviticus, is that the Kohen may marry the widow of a Kohen. He may marry the widow of a high priest. When I read Leviticus chapter 21 through 2216, I am well reminded of how American Christians once lived in a rather strict manner. Yeah, I've, I've just stated that the chapters of, you know, Ezekiel 43 through 47 are chapters that have yet to be fulfilled in a physical manner, but they do have a spiritual quality about them that can be fulfilled and walked out even now. Even now, okay? So, I am reminded how American Christians once lived in a rather strict manner. American Christians were descended from some of the best of the Reformation and were far more conservative than any conservative, politically speaking, nowadays. Uh, political conservatism nowadays is extraordinarily, uh, you know, to the left of what every American Christian was once upon a time. The Shakers, the Quakers, the Puritans, Puritans being the original, original rednecks, and many others were very devout to even these Torah principles that we've been reading about within this portion. And I applaud anyone who would seek to live a Puritan. I applaud anyone who would seek to live a pure life today. My, my hat is off to you. I, and that is not a uh, demeaning statement in whatsoever. I, I applaud. And I, it's, you know, all things, <clears throat> all things, all things with God are possible, including the pursuit of a pure life, the pursuit of the life that we read of in these texts of the Bible. Even what Yeshua, even what Jesus himself said, you know, if you marry a, he said, if you marry a divorced woman, you're, you're falling into perhaps a, I'm paraphrasing, but you're taking a chance on, on uh, being set up to see the same pattern happen again. So uh, he is actually repeating the, these same strict things and it's for our health. I feel that we have most certainly come into a highly cynical time of our history as a people within this nation, this nation being the United States of America. I know this may go out to someone outside of the USA, but I feel we've come into a highly cynical time. This highly cynical tone causes us to throw off anything and everything as though it were all profligacy. Now, profligacy is not that kind of word that uh, we're accustomed to. It's, uh, it's archaic, so to speak. And my oldest son may be right in saying that I'm, I may not be, trans, or, uh, I may not be uh, pronouncing that the way it should be. But I'll, I'll say profligacy. <laughs> so allow me to explain. Melek Shlomo, King Solomon, referred to himself as Kohelet, because he was part of part and parcel of the Kohal. The Kohal or Kahila, those are Hebrew words that are covered with the Greek word ekklesia within the Septuagint. That is Kahal, a word that goes all the way back to Genesis chapter twenty eight, verse three, gives us the word Kohelet. Kohelet means some you know, a church member, a member of the worldwide church, a member of the church that is called Israel. He spends Solomon, Kohelet, spins this letter called Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes comes from the word ecclesia, translated church. He spins the letter looking back on his past. Solomon is old right now. He wrote basically three main pieces of literature. He wrote the Song of Solomon when he was young. He wrote Proverbs when he was in his midlife. And he wrote Ecclesiastes when he was old looking back on his whole life. And so at this point, he's looking back, and he sounds even bitter, perhaps. He sounds, well, like he's at a state of profligacy. Profligacy means you just want to throw it all away. It's all, you consider it all, all of it, worthless. So, it appears to me that the greatest mere man of that era, if not for all eras, decided to treat earthly wisdom and heavenly wisdom as if they were one and the same thing. Okay, and when I say for me, 
I'm reading the text of Ecclesiastes, and the text says, doesn't imply, it says, that he collected earthly wisdom and heavenly wisdom and considered them one and the same thing. He points out that he had acquired hokmeva adat, that means heavenly wisdom and knowledge, and he goes on to say that he acquired into his heart both the knowledge of heavenly wisdom as well as da'at halilot vesekelut, that is, the knowledge of profligacy and earthly wisdom. And he says, quote, And I knew this to, to also be rayon ruach. Now, rayon ruach means nonsense in one word. If I were to find any one word that would translate that, it would be nonsense. But if I use both of the, because those are two words, if I translate each one of those words, it means evil spirit. He considered, and he repeats this phrase, he considers da'at halidot visakil, vis, uh, visiklut, pardon me. Siklut is the earthly wisdom, earthly wisdom, wisdom of man. Halilot is, is profligacy, da'at is knowledge. He considers that as an evil spirit. He brings all that together as one thing and calls it an evil spirit. Solomon decided to look further into, it says, Hokma viholilot visiklut. That is, heavenly wisdom, earthly wisdom, and profligacy all is one thing. He concludes that heavenly wisdom is far better than earthly wisdom. Heavenly wisdom is far better than that stuff from mere mankind. Indeed, he compares wisdom from heaven with light and wisdom from man as darkness. He says that. The rest of that letter, the rest of Ecclesiastes, stays in a mindset of profligacy, saying all things are worthless. Up until the end, when Solomon sums up the whole of man by saying, quote, Fear God and keep his mitzvot. Fear God and keep his commands. This is King Solomon's final conclusion to all of life. This is King Solomon, the wisest man perhaps of all time among mere men. Looking back on his life, he had accomplished everything. There was nothing unproductive about him. In terms of his thought life, he combined everything together and then found himself able to separate it out. But he goes on to say, everything is worthless. Just do this. Do this. This one thing. Fear God and keep his commands. This is the whole of who you are to be. So, I said that we, I feel that we have come into a time in America that we are despondent. We are cynical. And we are at a place of finding all things as profligacy. We're, we're throwing it all out as worthless. We're even angry about it. But I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to understand that there are two different kinds of wisdom in the Bible. There's earthly wisdom and heavenly wisdom. There's wisdom from above and wisdom of earth. And you can read about it in the first chapter of James and second chapter of James. But it's not all, it's not all good stuff, you see. And you can't combine it all as one wisdom. If you do so, you'll find out that it is uh, an evil spirit. But do you find fearing God and being Shomer Mitzvot, do you find fearing God and keeping His commands to be worthless? See, this is what Solomon says is, is the end statement. This is the conclusion of, of life. This is the simple life that you can live. The simple, non-confusing life that you can live. You know... Respect the Lord, keep his commands. Do you find that is worthless? A chasing of the wind, an evil spirit? You may want to consider or reconsider who your God is. Okay? Choose hope over cynicism, my friend. I've been there. I have been cynical. I understand what it means to be cynical, and I sound sarcastic when I get that way. I can revert back to that. I do that. I will probably do that in upcoming notes. But we must understand and try to reconsider who our God is, okay? And understand there are two different routes we can take. The Bible, Moses, after he presented Torah, said, I, I'm presented to you. What I've done is presented to you good and evil. I've presented to you life and death. Choose life. 
Choose hope, choose love over cynicism and chase God himself. Okay? My friends, I only want to, cons uh, I only want to encourage you, poke some courage into I, I'm not saying I want to compliment you. I said I want to encourage you. And uh, not make you feel good necessarily. This may not feel good. I don't know. But I do want to poke some chutzpah into you and encourage you to, to strengthen you, to seek him out and to chase him down. For the rest of your life, chase him. Amen. Shalom, shalom, my friends.